how am I standing on the shoulders and back of someone else? Um, and what space am I taking up or how are my actions, um, identity, uh, words, et cetera, et cetera, um, contributing to the oppression of other women? Um, and, and I think that the, the unapologetic part, um, if I could be so bold as to speak about the experience of being a woman generally is that there is a lot of shame that you're, you as a, or sorry, myself as a woman um, internalized as I was growing up, right? Um, shame for um, dressing a certain way, shame for feeling sexually in a certain way, shame for acting a certain way, um, shame for dating certain people um, or just anything that was outside the norm or what was what was shameful that was to me what being a woman was for those of you who aren't familiar with we ceremony we started this around um, late 2015 early 2016 um, and as both women of color we really wanted to create a space that was equitable and inclusive for women of color um, as you all know, living in Boston, Boston is one of the most racially segregated cities in the U.S. And so it was important for us to find our community and empower each other through our own experiences as women of color um, through storytelling. So if you're not on our newsletter, you can go to our website and register and then you'll get all of the fun stories and the events that we host. Um, we, do, we do try to host one once a quarter, but um, we're not making any money off of this. And so for those of you who participated in the raffle and the auction, we really appreciate it because all of the costs will go into our programming. Um, so a lot of people have asked us, why an ebook? Why did you decide to create an ebook? And I think for us and with the work that we do with We Ceremony, it's so important to visualize but also materialize our goal of seeing more representation of women and femmes of color. Um, not only on TV, not only in shows, not only in music, but also just leaders in our community, right? And that doesn't always necessarily mean that you're a politician or that you're a millionaire, but it could mean that you are a social worker, that you are a teacher, that you're a scientist. And we really hope with this ebook, with our amazing features, um, and they'll speak a little bit more about um, their work that they do in their own communities, but we really hope that this ebook can inspire um, to create change in your own community. And community can mean anything, right? It could be your small knit group of friends, maybe they're three to five, it could be your work community, it could be a faith-based or church community, um, but we really hope that it could ignite activism um, in your own life. And that doesn't also always necessarily mean like join a campaign, um, but it can mean speaking out against um, injustice, right, issues as well. So I think with that, we can get started. Uh, the first question is, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and what's a fun fact about you. Yeah. Anyone can start. I guess I can go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Shardlene Chanel Feito. I am 29 years old, and I'm from Boston, um, specifically the Roxbury Dorchester line. Um, by trade from nine to five, I work in the mayor's office of Fair Housing and Equity, where I investigate housing discrimination complaints in accordance with fair housing law. I am also a master student. I'm a master student at BU in the city planning. Um, my focus is more so on applied sustainability and just urban affairs in general. Uh, I'm also a lifestyle blogger, fashion blogger. <laughs> Um, I've been doing that since 2014. <laughs> um, I've been doing it uh, on and off since 2014, but more specifically when I got my first campaign with Ashley Stewart, which was featured on the New York Post and in many other publications, as well as my feature in Chronicle Channel 5. I don't know if you know that, but they did a feature on me as well. And that is it for now i think yeah so that's everything that i do and then it's always growing i love to talk about plus size women in different spaces in which we don't feel too comfortable i like to talk about fitness and why it's important for women of color especially plus size women to address their health concerns and some of the trauma that we may have deal with in the past and why we don't address it so readily um, and then I find a way to weave in environmental sustainability because it is at the heart of everything that we do, we just don't know it. So 
there's that, but I try to look at everything through a lens of equity, whether it's for plus bodies, whether it's for people of color, whether it's for children, no matter, I just want to make sure that we all have an equal playing ground and that we could all just kind of cohabitate together. What's a fun fact about you? Fun fact, oh, I love Soka, like a lot, a lot. <laughs> um, you can find me at any FET, which is like a party, a Soka party. I travel to anywhere in the world just so I can attend something that I haven't been to, but there needs to be Soka in the community. So I'm going to Japan next because I found the Soka community there. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, and to experience Japan, but definitely yeah. because there's a Soka community there as well. Yeah. So that's it. All right, so my name is Zubeda. Um, I am Pakistani American. Um, I. So when you're like sitting up here, you just like forget everything about yourself. I feel like I'm like, who am I? <laughs> um, I just graduated uh, my undergrad from UMass Boston in English. Yeah, about a week ago, so it's very, <laughs> very fresh. The wounds are fresh. <laughs> um, I um, my primary work that I am featured for is with this organization called Malaka. Um, it's a national organization that centers self-empowerment for Muslim women um, all across the nation. Um, and I am one of the board members of the Boston chapter, which is one of the newest chapters um, in this organization. Uh, we started last summer, technically, but we didn't really get the ball rolling until probably October. Um, and we primarily focus on self-defense for Muslim women. That's kind of our like claim to fame on a national scale. Um, but each chapter kind of does its own thing that they center. And so my team has been working really hard to create a sex ed program uh, specifically designed for Muslim femmes and women. Um, and we try to be as inclusive as possible using like they, them pronouns. Um, and try to really approach it in a way that isn't, it's not uh, rooted exactly in like tra the tradition of Islam, but like recognizing that um, Muslim women are not like a monolith, you know? Like we come from so many different experiences, we have so many different needs, um, and that's really our key focus. So that's kind of the bulk of the work we've been doing recently. Um, we also try to hold like healing spaces, um, we teach self-defense as I've mentioned, so yeah, we're very eager for community engagement and doing exactly what our community needs and a community that isn't just focused on like the narrative just like Arab Muslims or women who only wear hijab or things like that. We're trying to be as inclusive as possible. So yeah, um, fun fact about me. Um, I am allergic to mouthwash, which is really oh. weird. Yeah, it's a really inconvenient allergy, but yeah, I found out when I got my wisdom teeth taken out, and it was like, you know, that's when you're supposed to be using a lot of mouthwash, and I was like, why am I breaking out hives? Like, <laughs> um, hello everyone, my name is Lydia, I'm 25 years old. Um, for my nine to five, I work under the public health um, department for Fenway Health. Um, and specifically what I do is provide services um, to uh, mostly or primarily bilingual caseload. Um, and then I guess um, after the 5 p.m. clock strikes, um, I like to do um, a lot of organizing specifically within um, the community that um, I reside in and that's Everett. Um, so if you know ever, anyone in Everett, please come talk to me or Ileana. We definitely need more bodies. Um, but primarily, um, one of the projects that I'm most involved in right now is trying to change the language in um, the police department handbook um, in order to uh, just um, create a feeling of safe and security as a baseline for the immigrant um, communities in Everett. So if you'd like to know more. Um, Definitely talk to me. And a fun fact is I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're not very, I'm not a very fun person. <laughs> So, yeah, it's you. okay. I was once at work, and the icebreaker question was, "What's a fun fact about you?" And I couldn't think of it. And I was like, "I'm a lefty." <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for that. <laughs> 
Um, so our second question, and this is for everybody, um, where are you from? And that could mean many things, right? It could be your race, ethnicity, culture, um, but it also what is one thing you are most proud of within that identity? Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Oh, okay. So um, I'm surprised I didn't. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> surprised I didn't say this. Like, there's nothing more proud than me being just a Haitian woman in America. <laughs> um, my parents did a lot for us to get here, and I'm trying. I don't want to do the the waterworks stuff, but they did a lot for me to get here, and they put us in private school all the way. I wouldn't say that was the best idea because I was a very rambunctious against the system, <laughs> question every nun that came my way type of person. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, like they did try their best, the best way they knew how to. Um, so if there's anything that I can say that comes first, and I'm still surprised I didn't say it, is that I'm a Haitian American woman. I'm very, very proud of it. Um, as far as where I'm from, I said earlier, Dorchester, Roxbury area. A lot of my community organizing started there. Um, I want to say around 13, 14 years old, I got involved with a group called, or now an organization called DSNI, which is Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. And um, a lot of the work that I did there was like empowering youth, empowering people like myself to want to see change in their community. Where I live, there was we averaged at about, at the time, maybe 70 to 80 deaths a year. And some of them were my friends, some of them were kids I used to just play at the park. So it impacted me a lot, even though my mother was trying to shield us from that. Um, I felt at a very young age that I couldn't neglect it or not do something about it. So I did a lot of community organizing work, whether it was um, helping campaign for the next um, electorate that was coming in. So at the time, you know, I don't know if you guys heard of Chuck Turner, but he was really big in that community. And then I kept doing it. Like I, I came under Mayor Menino at 19 years old. He was an amazing mayor. He's like grandpa to me. Like I miss that man. Um, he was a, a very strong supporter of making sure that people empowered themselves so that they can empower the communities that they live in. And especially when it came to the Haitian community, when we were campaigning for him, I made sure I organized like a group of 60 people to campaign just for Mayor Menino because I knew how much he gave back to the communities of Mattapan and Dorchester, High Park, where most of the Haitians were. And they still think he's the mayor, even though he has passed. Um, but, and that's like, just like, you know, most people say the only person they acknowledge, only Chris they acknowledge is, you know, Chris Wallace. It's the same thing with Mayor Menino sometimes. So I try to really take on a lot of what he put in the community while being a mayor for 20 years and an elective official uh, prior to that. So a lot of what I do now, especially in the mayor's office, of Fair Housing and Equity, and even at BU, which was a program he supported, and he's like, apply for the scholarship, you'll get it. I got the scholarship, so less debt for me, but I get to actually go back into my community and apply some of that city planning that I learned. So those are the two communities that I'm affectionately tied to. Did I answer? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think I might have said earlier, but I am Pakistani American, and I am Muslim. Um, and those two identities, they often intersect, um, at least in my, in my experience for my life. Um, my parents were also immigrants. Um, so you know, I'm sure many people can relate to that experience of like, of having to balance like your family's culture and expectations with like living here and growing up here. Um, I was born in Colorado, but I grew up in the suburbs of Mass um, in a really <laughs> predominantly white area. Uh, which is, you know, always a, always a trip. But <laughs> um, yeah, I it was a it was a lot of. I really like the question about like what are you proud of in your culture? Because for me, growing up, I know many people can relate to. It was definitely a lot of shame. Um, definitely a lot of being bullied um, when I was younger for like you know the way my food smelled, the way my clothing looked, the way like just my name or just being Muslim and just you know just so many different things and not even just from students but also from the school board and from staff. Um, so a lot of shame, really. And it took a long time for me. Moving to Boston really honestly helped a lot because um, I finally started meeting people of color who like introduced me to like being like proud of who I was. Um, and even more recently, um, I've only recently now been finding um, Muslims too who make me feel like I, you know, belong. Like, because there's, so there's so much pressure on you to like 
be a certain way. And like that pressure comes from so many different spaces. Um, and uh, you know, it's really difficult to feel like, okay, you know, I'm worthy of calling myself a Muslim American or a Muslim Pakistani American. Um, yeah, so really Malika has been really important for that for me. Um, so I take a lot of pride in like everything that my, all the work that my people put into making us safe and taking care of our needs and looking out for one another. Um, and also I like our clothes, Pakistani clothes. Really pretty. Yeah, I got really into it, so I'm really proud of that now. Um, yeah, um, I think that's everything, right? Yeah. Do you mind repeating the question? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah. um, so where are you from? That could mean many things, but also one thing that you're most proud of. Okay. Um, yeah, very loaded questions. Um, so I was born in El Salvador. That's a country in Central America. Um, you might know us for our pupusas. Yeah, not, not, Mexico, not in Mexico. Not Mexico. Maybe back in like the 1800s, but we're, we're past that. Um, <laughs> Um, and I guess um, I came to this country uh, when I was very young and the first um, place that I called home when I was here was pre-gentrified Somerville. Notice the pre. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, <laughs> um, but I've lived most of my life um, or the greater part of my life in Everett, um, which has a very vibrant Haitian American, Brazilian American and Central American community. Um, so uh, that was very important to my identity forming, um, that I had a space in a community where I wasn't um, really shamed or questioned to um, thinking about how like Latina or Latinx enough I was. Um, and so I think that was very important in me understanding who I was as a person, who I was in um, relation to um, my quote unquote Americanness. Um, and I think one thing that I'm proud of, and this um, may seem strange the way I say it, but I'm proud of my journey and where I'm moving forward and what I'm sort of, um, and where it's taking me. And so what I mean by that is that I'm very proud that I've been given the privilege um, and the space to unlearn, dismantle um, a lot of the traumas that my family and my community carries um, with them, you know, um, by and large, historically or um, through um, interpersonal um, biases or, you know, just to say it, with racism and um, other um, xenophobia that we, we meaning Salvadorans, um, uh, put on other communities. And so um, I'm, I'm, that's something that I'm proud of and I think that um, it takes a lot um, for someone to kind of um, step out of your comfort zone and really question you know, the sort of normalized ideas, um, not just culturally but also gender as well. Um, so. Thank you. Um, a fun fact about our ebook and I have to give props to our photographer who traveled to every location we shot. But when we think about space that's inclusive for women of color, we're also talking about physical space too. And so each of the features, we asked them to pick a space that was the most significant to them. And we shot at the location of their choice. And so our third question is, if you can just share with us why you chose the location you did and what it means to you. Charlene doesn't have to start. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I guess I'll go. Um, so I picked the location, um, which is Everett High School, um, and I, I picked this location um, uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, one, uh, Everett High School is located on a hill, and the hill has a view of Boston, and I think that's a sort of metaphorical of my experience um, growing up in you know, a very close proximity to Boston, but never being part of Boston, um, and m how um, that relationship um, was to me growing up um, or going out of school. Um, and secondly, uh, the reason why um, I picked Everett High School, um, again, was it was the beginning of my, I guess, conscious or intentional formation of identity, um, which I could look back into, and that's, you know, being comfortable with, um, you know, hiding or 
proudly saying that I'm from El Salvador um, and the biases or the stereotypes that may come with that. Um, and then third, I think um, particularly uh, in this, um, environment that we're uh, currently living on, specifically political environment, um, I, I think about um, the young people um, who are trying to navigate not only hormonal changes in their body or you know these you know very meta um, questions about their identity or who they are, or what their place is, you know, in society, um, but also having to navigate. Um, all the the racism, the anti-immigration um, rhetoric that I really didn't have to go through to this level that's happening right now. Um, so it's just uh, something that I think about um, now being, you know, a much older, quote unquote, adult. <laughs> so. Um, so my photo shoot was something that many people think of when they think of Boston. Um, on a more conventional scale is the Boston Public Library. Um, I'm very interested in, well, first of all, I feel like it really encompasses um, my team and Monica's values of like accessibility. Um, you know, public libraries are something that like, literally like no other space like that exists in this country. And public education is very clearly under attack. Uh, it's very difficult to afford college, and many you know, obviously grade school. Many grade schools are underfunded, um, and with the current administration, it's just been getting more and more difficult um, for students to have access to knowledge that will ultimately help them in their positions. And for me, um, especially um, studying English and hoping to go into education. Um, I've just like even in my in my own self just witnessed the power of like being able to read voices that aren't traditionally taught, um, and libraries are so key to having access to those voices, um, you know, because you don't know, like we have so much opportunity now to search for ourselves for that knowledge that we want, and I literally was just reading an Asada Shakur quote talking about how like schools will not teach you like what you need to free yourself because these schools just represent the system that they're a part of. So yeah, I truly felt like a public library was like, the best way <laughs> to encompass that. <laughs> um, I chose right at Dudley Station. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the area, but growing up, I was told stay away from there, crackheads, bums, all of that. And I did stay away from there, especially because we're bussed out to schools that were out in white suburbs or, um, well, not really white suburbs. Uh, I was in the North End, which is right you know, near downtown. And then right across this way, I was in Brighton, right near Brighton High at an um, all-girl private institution over there. And when I finally was old enough to go to Dudley Station, like without my mother hunting me down, asking me where I was, I realized how beautiful it was. Like there were so much colors, there was so much food, there were so much little organizations that were doing so much work. And I was like, why was I alienated from this beautiful place? I mean, I could I saw a lot of what people were talking about. I did see the poverty, I did there's violence that happened. I lost a friend right up the street from there, but I saw how beautiful it was. Like the library was there, it was it was it's a beautiful place. So I had to pick that place in particular. And when people used to cast a shadow on Dudley, specifically around Dudley Station and the businesses there, I used to think, you know, they'll never put any reinvestment into it. It's going to be pretty much a lame duck or eyesore of the community. Of course, in 2018, with all the new gentrification trends, it's looking completely different. There are high rises. They are remaking buildings that probably should be going back to the community, but will be going to the highest bidder. There's a lot that's happening there that, you know, I. I'm active in speaking out against, but I still believe that the beauty is there. And I feel like if we can just continue galvanize, galvanizing the people in the area, letting them know this is ours, try your best to keep it if you can, because you know the powers that be will move it. Money talks, so it's it's very hard, and we're, we're not a very galvanized community in general, because we go through a lot. There's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot for us to hold on our own but I specifically picked it because I still feel like it's my own. I don't have no crazy tax bracket or anything, but I do know that that place is still mine, regardless of who comes in. 
Thank you. Um, so like Moo mentioned, with the location, it was something that was really significant for us for this ebook. But also, I think every thought process was also very intentional as well, along with the title. Um, so with the title, it's um, Liberación. I'm not going to try to pronounce the rest because I'm going to butcher them. But um, it's also it's um, translated to liberation. But we also have it in Haitian Creole and Portuguese and also Chinese, which are common traditional language. Traditional Chinese. Yes, traditional yeah, Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> which, which are commonly spoken languages here in the Boston area. Um, but as a follow-up, um, the larger title of our ebook is called Unapologetic Women of Color. Um, so that's our follow-up question. What does being an unapologetic woman of color mean to you? And again, it's very loaded. But in terms of your journey and the work that you're doing now and that you want to do in the future. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, and a lot of the times I will uh, reference growing up because I do see there's a, a huge transition in who I am today. But growing up, I was in a lot of white spaces. So I was always silenced or felt that I was silenced. I felt that I couldn't speak against the status quo because people would make fun of me. I was already getting bullied for being a bigger girl, so just to add that I felt embarrassed or wrong about something just made it way worse. So it wasn't until I got to college where I kind of found my voice because it was not a Catholic <laughs> education setting, so that's the only place where I could really voice my opinions. And with the plethora of school organizations that were there, I was able to develop my voice. I was able to find more people like me. I was able to have my first Haitian best friend and have a, my first fashion show where I included plus size women. Shout out to Ms. Bella over here who was actually in the fashion show. So um, so we go way back. But um, She's a designer. Yes. yes. Clap it up for her because she, she makes amazing clothing. But um, when I was able to kind of find my voice and find what made me, then I was able to be more vocal about it. I'm very vocal about it at work, whether they don't they want to hear it or not. And I still have a job, so I think uh, they're putting up with me. And that's the beauty of having such a great mayor that we have now. Mayor Walsh, he's, he's a great mayor. He lets you speak. He lets you say what you have to say without fearing persecution. It doesn't feel like I'm in the wrong place when I say things. So I love working there, and I love even educating some of the people, the constituents who come through our door to advocate for themselves. So when it comes to me thinking about me being an unapologetic woman, it's really just living in your truth. Mm -hmm. Just being able to come out and say what you have to say. You are going to feel, you are going to get a lot of pushback. I've received a lot of pushback. I receive it in my classroom all the time. There are like four of my great classmates. I like them as people, but they're awful Trump supporters. So we're always going back and forth in class. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to hate you because of, you know, where your political aspirations are or anything, but you know, I, I'm, I can still reason with you. And I feel like that is the perfect way to start being unapologetic, understanding who you are, stay, sticking to who you are or growing, because I have to do a lot of growing, but then also challenging a lot of the people out there who like to keep a certain type of thinking, because you can give me a new perspective right now, and I will digest it, I will think about it, I'm not going to push you away, because we all come from different frameworks, we all look through different lens, and inevitably we all grow from different places, so you know, you growing up in your community, and you growing up in your community is gonna be different mine, or it could be the same, but nonetheless acknowledging who we are and sharing that with the world, we shouldn't be afraid to do so, because that's really what makes the world work. <laughs> it's a big question. Um, let's see. So for me, um, a lot about understanding myself as a woman of color was like really rooted in privileges, I think. Um, I think like the big first movement I did get involved with when I like I did, like activism wasn't even something that was on my radar when I was young. I mean it was in ways, you know, in more conventional, acceptable ways. Like I worked for um, Amnesty International in high school, um, but I still there was so much I just didn't understand simply because of where I was growing up and what we were being taught. Like you know the traditional public school narrative that like oh you know racism ended in the sixties. And um, really, like insane things that they teach you, and it really complicated 
my understanding of myself and my experience is because I, you know, if I was told, okay, this isn't racism because racism is over, so what is going on? Like, is it just like I'm like not a good enough person for these people? Um, you know, and a lot of my journey was um, really began with like the Black Lives Matter movement and seeing all these events unfold and learning from that and learning, you know, what it means to be a, a woman of color who is not black. Um, and what my role is in that and how so much of my identity is rooted in my contributions simply by my existence to other people's oppression and how my job is often talking to my own community about what, you know, what we need to be doing better, um, especially in the Muslim community because disproportionately, um, you know, the image is perpetuated of Muslims being Arab or, um, yeah, that image. But like, predominantly, we're, uh, Muslims are African American or African or just black in general. Um, so how do we create safer spaces for these Muslims? How do we give them a platform? How do we make sure that they're protected, not only from outside, but from within our community? Um, so for me, I think understanding how to be an unapologetic, unapologetic woman of color was learning um, how I can understand my place. I think that's what it is, yeah. Um, ditto, definitely. Um, uh, uh, when I think of the term woman of color, I remember um, a sort of historical anecdote. Um, and I don't know um, the historicity as well as I should, but what I do know, or what the important tidbit that I want to share with you is that woman of color was a term um, that um, we as non-black women of color were allowed to use um, and were lended. Um, and so that's something um, that I uh, uh, carry with um, a lot of consideration, right, for what you said, uh, which is how am I standing on the shoulders and back of someone else? Um, and what space am I taking up or how are my actions um, identity, uh, words, et cetera, et cetera, um, contributing to the oppression of other women. Um, and, and I think that the, the unapologetic part, um, if I could be so bold as to speak about the experience of being a woman generally, is that there is a lot of shame that you're, you as a, or sorry, myself as a woman, um, internalized as I was growing up, right? Um, shame for um, dressing a certain way, shame for feeling sexually in a certain way, shame for acting a certain way, um, shame for dating certain people, um, or just anything that was outside the norm or what was, what was shameful. That was, to me, what being a woman was. Um, and so now having to unlearn um, and dismantle all these um, traumas that are sort of placed on me, um, I think that that's a step in becoming unapologetic, right? Um, a step in not um, covering my shame and not, you know, covering who I am, but really um, standing boldly and just putting it out there um, that this is who I am. And of course, you know, there's a lot of fear wrapped up in that, um, but um, shame doesn't go away if you, if I keep it, you know, within myself hidden, um, it, it, if you, if you keep talking about it, you, um, normalize it, right? Um, and you make it, um, not as hurtful to you. Uh, so that to me is what it means to be an unapologetic woman of color. You all are very respectful because this is supposed to be a fireside chat. Um, but since we do have two more questions, but we're almost at 8 o'clock, and I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask our speakers, our features, some questions. So um, fire them away. OK. So I think this question is more on the line of allyship and um, how can non um, people of color be supportive, and how have they um, contributed to your journeys? The one thing I could say is like own up to your privilege. You know what I mean? It's kind of, I mean, it's great to be in the Black Lives um, Matter 
the Black Lives Matter movement. It's great to be in these spaces, but always owning where your privilege is, is always at least saying, you see me and I see you. And sometimes that's just like the bigger barrier, the elephant in the room that we quite don't get to see. So even researching more about what that means through different ways, not just through like, you know, CNN or definitely not Fox News, but like <laughs> definitely looking at it from different angles. You know what I mean? Because um, truth is you may never actually feel what we felt. Truth is you may never go through what we went through or are going through, but understanding where you fit into it and how you'd benefit from a lot of what we are receiving on our end is always a great start. Um, again, that's my you know, way of looking at it. There are some people who are just like, no, you need more, you need to come harder. But um, because I've been in multiple spaces in my life and I know that it's going to keep carrying me to be in other places, it's always a good starting point. If someone does not acknowledge it, and I'm not saying, come up to me, I'm white and I understand what I've done. Like, no, don't do that. <laughs> do not do that. <laughs> because it, it, it won't work for me. But just understanding <laughs> understanding where you are and how you fit into a place and just respecting those boundaries. As I wouldn't go into someone else's space and just insert myself into something either because um, that sets more tension and kind of contributes to the state of where we are in the US or just as a people across the globe. Um, kind of to piggyback off that, um, I guess trying to really identify more tangible ways you can put that into practice within your community. Um, even if it's like, it doesn't have to be like a show of like going to a protest or anything like that. Like these changes are things that like, there's so many different forms of racism or um, microaggressions that we have to deal with. And finding ways to maybe even just like have those conversations that are difficult with your family. Like if you know you have family members who might have views that are wrong or hurtful to another group, um, it's not easy. And being willing to be uncomfortable and understanding that you have a lot less to lose, I think, in those positions. Um, I think of like how recently my friend who wears hijab, um, she was talking about how when she flies, you know, obviously she gets a lot of difficulty. Um, with security and or just people even just like looking at her and giving her nasty looks you know and I, I get away with a lot because I don't wear hijab so I'm not really visibly Muslim so you know, it, makes my, it does make, truly make my life easier um, but she was recently flying with a white friend and whenever um, somebody would be giving her a nasty look her white friend would like check that person would just like look at them make eye contact make sure they look away yeah, really, and like, yeah, really though, like, and it makes such a, like, because what's going to happen to that woman? Literally nothing, like, you know, people might give her some attitude, but like, she has a lot less to lose than my friend who does wear her job and does have to worry about her physical safety. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, just talking to people of color, like people, and being like, what do you need me to do for you in this moment? How can I be supportive to you? Um, yeah, it's, it's very intentional work, and it takes time, and yeah. <laughs> Uh, one more thing I'd like to add is also something um, that I've learned in my journey about um, working through uh, my own communities and my my own anti-blackness, um, and that's um, learning, right? And I think that um, there's a lot of information and a lot of great resources um, that I look into um, that have already been written by um, black women, black femmes, um, talking about um, doing the actual work of understanding first like what it is, how we contribute to it, and how we can, you know, maybe it's not dismantling it right away, but it's about taking the baby steps about making it less violent, right? Um, and then secondly, I think that some of the more like en vogue or mainstream um, um, like activism that's going on, I think that they do sort of have platforms for allowing allyship, right? Um, and that looks differently um, in different ways. Um, some ways that I've um, particularly shown solidarity or allyship to um, uh, organizations or causes that don't particularly personally affect me, um, I think is one using like my monetary value. Um, so definitely um, with donation if that's an option. Um, and then secondly to uh, labor, right? Or any skills that you may have to offer. Like if someone um, needs something um, transcribed or you know they're just looking for volunteers, um, that's definitely an absolute, an absolute way that you can 
like physically, literally contribute um, to the work that's being done. Thank you. Yes? Um, each of you has an immigrant experience um, or spoke to an immigrant experience. What I'm curious about is, um, and in some ways, um, identifying as a woman of color is something that's uniquely almost American. And so I'm curious about how that has worked, because I think each of you kind of talked about living in a different territory in your home versus what you've had to deal with outside in the real world. And so I'm curious about that kind of negotiating and holding on to and grabbing on to being an unapologetic woman of color and how that vibes with your home life or like your identity with how you relate with family or your culture and how that's played. I mean, I guess. You mind if I Okay. Um, this is something I, I've thought a lot of before. Um, and I think that um, sometimes, um, for me, it absolutely can seem like it's at odds, right? Um, but there's a lot there, right? And I think that. Um, there's a lot that I draw from, um, particularly uh, uh, um, coming from colonialization, right, in my experience, right? And what does it mean um, for me now to reclaim, right, um, my sort of identity, my history? And is this really something that's at odds because I'm now more American and more assimilated? Or is this something that always belong to me, right? Um, is this something that, um, unfortunately, for the women um, of my past or the women that um, I lay heritage to didn't have the space or the access um, to do so, right? Um, and so this is something that I still think about a lot because, um, for one, like I said, it, it is a borrowed term, right? Um, and it is something that um, particularly when I think of colonialization and particularly when I think about Latin America, there's a lot of um, anti-blackness that also goes there, um, right? We know that um, the slave, um, excuse me, the Middle Passage didn't just end up in the U.S. Um, a lot, a lot went to Latin America. And, you know, I, I can stand up on this stage and there's people that are darker than me when we're talking about Latinos um, or Latinx or that claim that they're white, right? And, and what, is, what does this mean, right? When we're erasing one visible part of our identity, right? And how is me claiming um, any sort of color, whether that's um, as a title, right? As an, as an identity here in the US, how is that at odds with what I've been instinctually um, taught from my community, right? Um, and I think that also, to, to, to complicate it a little bit more, I think that um, I, I am particularly speaking from my experience as um, a Salvadoran woman that left El Salvador very early. But I think there's work being done right now in Latin America about stretching these boundaries, right? And about identifying and reclaiming um, you know, their heritage, um, their West African heritage. and. Um, um, their black heritage, right? And about reclaiming the word black in Spanish or um, Portuguese or whatever um, different language there is in Latin America. And so um, when I think about these two different ideologies happening almost, oops, sorry, <laughs> almost happening in sync, um, I, I tend to kind of um, want to see myself in relationship to those movements, right? Um, and see um, where I fit in um, and see how you know, I can learn more from this as a non-black woman, right? Um, uh, but a woman that still comes from um, cultural antecedents that are very plainly black, right? And that we're the ones that are constantly doing that erasure. Yeah, um, this is probably like one of the central issues of my life. So the, when, that's why I was making a face when you were saying that question because I was like, damn, this is hard. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is like so much that I think of all the time that me and my friends are always discussing. Um, oh 
because like there really is a privilege in being American and recognizing that like you know like I talk like me and my friends talk a lot about like westernized or imperialist feminism um and feminism does not look the same for everybody or every culture and it's I guess for me like it's been about like learning to be humble in understanding that um you know the like the ways that like my the way I'm like my mother for example um what she wants what she thinks is best for me and how that might not align with what I want but still recognizing you know what like she she's not like I'm not smarter than her I'm not better than her I'm not more advanced than her um we you know we simply have different contexts different understandings of what it means to be successful and be safe and um she she does know a lot that I don't understand because like when it comes down to it I may be Pakistani American but that is its own identity I'm not Pakistani and I'm not a white American it's a very unique third space um so I guess it is kind of uncharted territory because you know I'm kind of learning to navigate like how do I respect my family while also respecting myself um yeah I know yeah and you know it's it's an ongoing thing like for in my culture it's very common for women to get married at a younger age at my age um and that's a big theme <laughs> trust me it's a big theme but it's also like it's also difficult because the, you know the the narrative of muslim women is that oh like we're submissive to men or we're forced to like into these marriages so it's also like where is my space to talk about that in a way that isn't used to demonize my people you know yeah. um like how do i have that truth like how do because like I've seen this instinct too that I've also had when like like Muslim men have harassed me. It's like, but do I want to put this out there in the world so people can say, oh Muslim men, look at Muslim men. Like what, you know, I don't, I don't want, so it's like, but why also, why is that my burden to protect them in that way when they also are harming me directly? Um, yeah, so there's just so many, there's so many layers, so many layers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so many layers. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> A ditto to both of what they said. <laughs> Seriously, like, <laughs> thank you for going first. Um, and just for me to add, like, um, as I said, I'm Haitian, but I think uh, a lot of different people from Caribbean nations could, you know, identify. Growing up in a Haitian household, it was just like the three L's. We say it, l'église, l'école, and it's something else. It's another L. <laughs> I see that you got it on the tip yeah, of your tongue. L'église. So basically... <laughs> Church school and it's an L. But basically, like, those were the three things that I pretty much could only really surround around doing in the house. It was probably something to do with, uh, I'll never know. But I'll look, <laughs> but I'll, find, I'll tweet it out or something, and you guys will know. I'm pretty sure if you Googled it, it will come up. Um, but it was, it, there's been like, a lot of uncharted territory, a lot of me and my mother fighting, a lot of me running away and being a Haitian girl running away from the home and not to go get married to a man, but to actually get away from my mother. There's been a lot of just like pushback about me being this outspoken person and under telling my mother that not you should respect me in a, a demeaning or in a way in which that I'm not honoring her, but understanding that like I am growing just as you are growing. And you at one point, you know, had to be under my, my grandmother's rule, as I call it, but you were able to flourish. Unfortunately, in my mother's um, time, it was more so when you got married or when you had kids. I'm not dating, I have no kids. Um, not to say that I don't want it, but no, now it's not in a space where I feel like I need it because it makes me more Haitian, because it makes me more a woman, which is what I grew up learning that I was neither if I didn't have any of that and I could confidently say today I feel more of a woman than I've ever felt not more than a woman in my mother's eyes not saying that she is not a woman because she hasn't you know achieved those three L's or because she's achieved the three L's or that because she's had all that but because I'm getting to be who I want to be while respecting others and growing my community I feel like it takes a lot of woman balls to do that okay <laughs> it takes a lot of woman balls to do that because we're always told that we can't we're even outside of the the Haitian like context, women in general, like even the pay wage, it's showing that we are thought of as less, we are valued as less. Mm -hmm. And Haitians kind of acknowledge that. They kind of acknowledge, and I won't say all of them because we're growing. We're growing in different directions, for, but for the most part, I was learning to take a back seat 
and the back seat is just not somewhere I'm comfortable sitting. I hardly fit in the back seat of most cars, <laughs> let alone <laughs> not being able to drive my own car. So it's it's always going to be hard. I know that if children or you know being um, impactful in a young Haitian woman's life is going to be my trajectory, I want to make sure that they don't feel what I felt growing up. They don't feel like they have to get married. Like my sister, love her, she's a nurse. She did exactly what Haitians wanted. You're, you go to school, you become a nurse, you have your kids. And she's younger than me. She, she did the young thing. But you know, and everyone looks at me like, look at Charlene, like she doesn't want a perm. She, <laughs> she's always traveling. She's probably been to 12 different churches and she likes all of them all the same. She makes no sense. But I feel more whole than I've ever felt because I get to be me. And sometimes that means breaking away from your culture. I mean, I'm still going to speak Creole fluently. I'm still going to throw down better than any Haitian that I know. Um, I'm still going to, you know, be as Haitian as I could be. But there are some cultural barriers that I knew that I had to kind of dismantle and break down if I still wanted to be who I was in America. Now, had I been born in Haiti, would it be the same? I don't know, but I think the little Scorpio spark in me was going to push me to this direction anyway. So um, ditto to both what you said, but like sometimes it's going to be that you can't stay in both places or one place you're going to outgrow and that's okay. That doesn't make you less of where you're from or where you claim you're from. It just means you're growing and growth is natural. Well, damn. Thank okay, you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Ileana always and I always have such a hard time responding after our panels because everyone says something that I think, although our experiences are not the same, we can certainly relate to and it's a lot to process. And so thank you so much for sharing with us. I think we just have question, um, time for one more question. What would you say are the best methods for pushing a bilateral agenda of both climate change sustainability and dismantling the systems of oppression in the context that, as we see this reversal of white flight, especially in a segregated Boston, people of color are losing a lot less space to live in. Mm -hmm. And I believe that climate change is only going to make the effects of racism a lot more heard and seen and felt in very dangerous ways in this country. So how do we truly empower communities of color to become resilient and sustainable? Uh, about, I want to say, has it been a month yet? About a month ago, I just finished my senior capstone at BU, and it was actually critiquing the city of Boston's climate action plan and critiquing it through the lens of equity, which is something that, again, I apply in every part of my life. So uh, some of the more, OK, I want to keep my job. So some of the more <laughs> um, alarming things that I saw were that a lot of the investment that the city has put in has been towards coastal neighborhoods and towns. So we're talking about the seaport. We're talking about certain pockets of East Boston. We're talking about South Boston. We're talking about places that are the wealthiest parts of the city of Boston. And then the parts that are disinvested in or that they're not actually addressing at all, and it may change in their next iteration of the Climate Action Plan, after you know they heard my mouth, um, <laughs> was that the communities that are experiencing the heat island effect are Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, which are the areas that are of color, that are poor, that have um, less access to resources, that have a lot of bad health outcomes, a lot of elderly people. And they're already saying that the urban heat island effect has already began. It's not like we're waiting for the flood to come over and it's, that's just a structural fix that they're just going to build it out and make sure that all these sea, the seaport or the, the, the waterfront properties are protected, but these are people's actual lives. And I do not believe you could put a dollar amount on a single life loss. And if it's only rising, it's not like we're doing any better, especially if you know people like to pull out of the, pa the Paris Agreement we're, we're out here and we're gonna be burning up. We're burning up in the hood. That's basically what's happening. So me and my capstone partner, her name is Natasha White. I can't say that I did this by myself, but she's also a city employee. She works in the budget office. And we both looked at the plan and not in disgust, but like, all right, let's give the city a benefit of the doubt and say it was an oversight because they received a lot of coastal flooding uh, you know, funding. So this is why they're looking at it this way. But we had to definitely find a way to hold them accountable. And that's always just the first place. 
holding the people that you pay your dollars to accountable. Like, people underrate it so much. Like, people, if you just went to vote, when I always say to my district, District 7, go vote because I bet you they'll act. If you just went out in rows, where I live, we have probably the lowest voter turnout, mm -hmm. but I bet you that more politicians and more of the people who represent you would do so much more if you showed up to vote because it's gonna be like, I'm out of a job or my agenda will never be pushed if I'm no longer in office. So I always want people to hold those people account accountable. And that includes me, I, I am a city worker. Hold me accountable because A, it makes my job 10 times better. Mm -hmm. And then B, like this is, I don't feel like I can affect change in anyone's life if I'm not being held accountable, if I'm just going by day to day. But if we're going to, if some people alienate the, the um, government altogether, and that's okay. Like we have, people have different reasons as to why they don't want to deal with the government. I think our current leadership is probably one of the reasons why, and will always be one of the reasons why. But there's also a lot of grassroots things happening within these communities, you know? A lot of these communities, they do know what's happening. They have tried to address it. It's just really hard to get people to talk about climate change where they don't see the effects. You will see the flood in 2030, but you may not always hear about the elderly woman who passed out because of heat exhaustion or the little girl who passed out because she also has asthma and she had also a heat stroke or something. That happens and it happens a lot and it's very real. So it's really just finding a way to bridge these different entities. If it's private sector investment, if it's the government actually trying to I don't want to say give a damn, but actually trying to show that they're going to meet us halfway, they will meet us halfway. They will. I, I know that they will. They actually tried the outreach, but it's actually getting people see that climate change is a sexy topic. And it's not really sexy. A lot of the sexy topics are kind of like, where am I going to live because the rent's too high? Or um, you're giving out free money, great, how can I get access to it? Which never really happens. But like th those are more of the reasons why people come out and actually listen to what the city has to to offer. Again, it's not a bash to the city. It's just they needed a wake-up call. Like most people just need a wake-up call. And I think that if more people in the community understood the effects of what's going to happen to them, because there was for a long time we never grew up with AC. I slept by the window because AC was it's too expensive. Now that we're going to have like trends of 90 degree weather all the time, I have to reason with my mother. I'm like, you need this. You have health issues and you need it. Um, so I wish there was a better clear cut answer because it's, it's a very top down approach, you know? But when you have these grassroots um, different communities such as REAP, which actually really empowers youth to look at canopy space, meaning, you know, planting more trees in the city, like you have to support them. They're not asking for your money per se, but they're asking just for you to attend to attend an event just for 10 seconds so you can be educated on what you can do. Even if it's small things like learning to turn off your lights or you know unplugging things we're not, when you're not using them, those little things are important because if everyone does them, then you reduce the, the, the greenhouse emissions that are going out into the earth, which causes this overheating of the earth. I feel like my professor would be so proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> I think she would. <laughs> I also want to add um, uh, just one point too, and then it's like, who, where are we getting, or where are our families getting this messaging from that um, you know that they don't care about the environment or that it isn't important to them? Um, what happens with the environment? Um, I know, um, at least personally, that my first experience of knowing how to be a steward in this earth and how to respect the planet was from my family, right? And that was about recycling the margarine bowl and having repollo in that, you know? And using, yeah, and using that, using that plastic bag to do everything. You, you know when the, when the dye comes and you gotta, you gotta let that set, you put the bag on, yeah, you, you know, don't play, okay. But, but, no, but no one tells us like you are being innovators, right? Being being green or being environmentally friendly isn't you know buying like organable grass fed like it is that, but for fourteen ninety nine, yeah okay. So, <laughs> but so it's like um, 
definitely what you said. It, it comes from grassroots. I know um, at least in the Everett Chelsea area, there's Green Roots, an organization that's led by Latinos, talking specifically about environmental issues. And I think that this also intersects with another issue, which is um, language accessibility. Like, if if these you know messages were accessible to our communities in a language in a way that's um, coded for them in a Spanish that they're comfortable with, because I don't know the proper environmental terms, right? Um, I definitely um, have a very like limited Spanish knowledge. Um, so <laughs> so it's it's um it's about understanding maybe what what sort of messages are wrapped around like almost the whitewashing of these issues and how these issues like you only the only way you can contribute and the only way you can um, incite change is with money right um, and it's not looking at the things that um, me or you know our very low socioeconomic communities have already been doing just because of pure necessity um, and how we can empower them to stay to keep doing that right and maybe the recognition will never be there right maybe you know I don't know, um, Joe Schmo from the seaport may not use the margarine bowl to keep buttons, but, <laughs> but, but it's still about knowing that, you know, they are, they're probably doing it because they do understand sustainability and it may not be in this like high level academic way that, you know, it's, it's kind of put out, at least to me, the way that I understand it, right? Um, but it's still, you know, playing a part in the sustainability movement, just how some people carpool, just how some people buy a bike, it's just a different form of doing it, right? And just to add to that, I'm really glad that you mentioned Chelsea as well because um, ExxonMobil, I don't, I can't remember how many tons of like waste and oil they dump into the Chelsea Creek every single day. Um, and that's, I mean, I don't, I didn't know that um, until like a couple months ago, but it's also like how, can we be more involved in our communities too? And also organizing. Organizing is so, so important because you're learning at the same time. You're also mobilizing your neighbor, your family members um, for these issues. And areas like Chelsea, Everett, East Boston that are closest to the airport, um, people that live in that surrounding area um, are highly affected with asthma, migraines, and these are all contributing factors um, to climate change, but also um, these different situations as well so I would just say that organizing is so so important and it's horrible that um, you have to apply to a grant to protect your own community I think that's also something that we don't talk enough about I also grant writing isn't my favorite but it comes with the job um, but for you to actually have to prove like this is happening in my community and that Everett doesn't even have an emergency plan for flooding for fires for nothing um, so it's really important to talk with your city councilors and not wait until something drastic happens as well. But thank you again so much um, to our features, but also to all of you for coming here today for the questions and just also engaging in these conversations. Um, and we hope that you can take a look at the ebook and read a little bit further in, in depth to the stories of these three amazing women in our communities and different communities here in Massachusetts. So thank you. Okay.